Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Welcome to Hashing It Out, a podcast where we talk to the tech innovators behind blockchain infrastructure and decentralized networks. We dive into the weeds to get at why and how people build this technology and the problems they face along the way. Come listen and learn from the best in the business so you can join their ranks. Welcome back, everybody, to Hashing It Out. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Corey Petty. Colin is still in the process of moving his life elsewhere across the United States, so he's not joining us today. Um, I'm really excited about this episode. Uh, it started from a tweet storm that I read that I really, uh, really, really enjoyed based on some insight it gave me as to um, some relationships I'd never really thought about before. And uh, today we have Vinay Gupta, CEO of Materium, uh, coming on to uh, the author of this tweet storm, coming on to tell us a little bit about this concept and where it leads to and what, what, kind, of, what kind of impact it has on um, all of the things we are all trying to work on uh, on the internet and society and so forth. So Vinay, welcome to the show. Um, why don't you give us a quick introduction as to kind of who you are, what you do, how you got here, et cetera. Sure. Uh, good to be here. Um so my kind of main role with the blockchain space was I was the project manager for the Ethereum launch. Uh, but my background in crypto goes into the 1990s. Um, probably wrote my first uh, cryptographic application in 97. Just, you know, helped some other people as part of a team. Uh, and then spent um, quite a while being paid in e-gold in 99. So that was my first exposure to digital cash as a concept. Uh, and then after 9-11, uh, I left tech and I headed into energy policy. And I spent 14 years kind of bouncing around between energy policy, defense think tanks, and sustainable development charities, trying to find some comprehensive way of getting a grip on global poverty and some of the environmental stuff that goes on around it. Uh, then Ethereum came along. And you know I hadn't heard people talking about smart contracts in a real way for years. It was like... It was the high watermark of the first round of the cypherpunk revolution. Mm -hmm. That was that was you know the discussion about smart contracts was kind of the the crest of that wave, and then everything went dead for a long time after nine eleven. And then I heard people talking about smart contracts and again. It's like okay, right, that's my ship. I'm getting on that one. Uh, and you know here we are. Uh, and what I'm doing right now is I run a company called Materium, which is basically doing digital identity work, but for physical objects. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of complex reasons why I think we need that, but it all comes down to figuring out how to manage scarcity globally in a way which is more efficient than the current capitalist free market model. So that's there's a lot to move in there, and I I think that's it's a it's a concept that I think everyone has a idea or like understands that at least in the like in the blockchain world that it's, it's something we're moving towards and something that's very important. But I think there's a maybe a lack of insight or framework to understand why that's important. Um, and this this sweet storm that you, you started out with gave me a little bit of that, I think, um, or at least the words uh, to put towards the mental framework I ha already had in my head. And it started. You did something. It was let's see. It was a July twentieth. Started it out. And I'll just read the first one. Um, I've been put I've, from you. I've been biting down very very hard on the semantics of the relationship between people and their stuff. For more than 10 years, it goes back to resilience, resiliencemaps.org and the questions about how things relate to each other, laptop to charger to solar panel, I've been grinding. And from there, you go on from a, a really long uh, discussion on stuff, people and their stuff. And an, an important part of that was a, like this, this separation that you, or this aha moment that you had, which was um, you had always grown up uh, based on this tooth storm combined or not separated the differences between um, tools and skills. Um, that's something you kind of put together based on your upbringing. And then you finally came to the realization that those two things are fundamentally separate for most people. Can you talk about that? Exactly. So, I mean, I come from a fundamentally handy family, right? Uh, on my mother's side, um, uh, she was a nurse. Her father was a carpenter and her mother was a weaver. 
So, you know, they were people that knew how to make things with their hands. And I grew up in a house full of tools. Um, so that sort of changes your opinions on, you know, like how things work, right? You know, I grew up in a household where learning to use tools was a regular part of daily life, right? You know, this is a stethoscope, this is a chisel, this is a saw, this is a darning needle. It was a very kind of tool rich environment. Um, and it was, you know, completely natural to me to think of a, a sort of basic human activity of learning how to use a tool, acquiring a tool, and then using the tool as being a natural activity that you do like reading a book. Right. I you need know, to do this thing. Go find the thing that helps me do it. Get the thing done. Right. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, I guess this is going to require, you know, a skill saw. Right. Then. Right. You know, which mm -hmm. skill saw do I? How do you learn how to use it? You do a few test cuts. You know what you're doing. Right. Let's cut some board. So that approach was soaked very deep into my DNA. And one of the things that I'm learning as I get older is it's very easy to make really profound and subtle mistakes by thinking that other people feel or see the world in the same way that you do. Um, or if you're inside of a particular professional environment, you get very used to people that see and think the world in that sort of way. Then you come across people that are looking at it in a completely different way and everything, you know, kind of changes very suddenly, right? You know, you think you, you think you're like, if you're in a medical environment and you're dealing with a lot with doctors, they've got a terrible sense of humor around death. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if you tell a joke from that environment in or, you know, a room full of people that are flower arrangers, you're in dead trouble. Yeah, they don't have, they don't have the, the kind of, the, they've never had to deal with the situations to build that up as a necessity. So they, they think you're morbid or have, a, have an issue. That's right. And, and they're filtered differently because yeah. people don't have that relationship with death, don't wind up in medicine. <clears throat> so what I sort of realized was that to me, tools and skills were the same thing. Because you could always add the tools, the skill to the tool, right? Wherever it is, I can pick it up and learn how to use it. Off we go, right? And the the kind of the now here here I've got to explain a wee bit more. This is another rabbit hole. So the simple the resilience mapping system there is something that I designed when I was doing a whole bunch of worst case scenario planning work for governments, and it was a new way of thinking about how to understand the physical terrain on which things like earthquakes play out. Right? And in that model, what you're really looking for is a network of connected bureaucracies that work together to operate your society. Right? The power company talks to the water company to supply them the energy to run the pumps that turn into tap water. The uh, hospital also has an agreement with the electricity provider. They've got a backup generator which runs on diesel. If they fail over, now they're dealing with the diesel supplier. So. What you have in a disaster is a breakdown in the network of bureaucracies that operates your world. And for years, I had been questing for a much lower, res uh, lower level, higher resolution map for how physical objects interact with each other in parallel to those bureaucracies. So you had you 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 had uh, kind of a an amalgam of, of physical objects and you were building relationships among them that then build up to what we see from like a social perspective. Exactly, right? And this was all in mind for trying to keep systems running <clears throat> in the event that you've got a sudden rapid uh, disruption. Yeah. So things begin to go seriously wrong. A whole bunch of people are now thrown into the front line to handle that. You know, think of like post-earthquake stuff, right? Mm -hmm. In Haiti, they got the cell phone networks back on in less than 72 hours, right? My recollection is it might have been under 48. And that happened because the cell phones were distributed infrastructure and therefore were extremely resilient. All they did was they took a diesel generator to the cell phone masts, stewed the mast back up and turned the generator on. And in most cases, the equipment would work. It was, a, it was an amazingly resilient system. Um, so... It was kind of a, it was a realization that, oh no, this is the, so this is the, this is the, the needle in the haystack. So if you come across a buying technology, right, you know, you have a microphone, you plug it into a USB port, it just works, right? 
I have a microphone, I plug it into a USB adapter that will connect it to a USB-C device and it doesn't work. Okay, I don't know why. I'm never gonna be able to debug that. Let's plug it in, it didn't happen. So that experience, there's no mediating bureaucracy around that USB port, right? If it doesn't work, there's nobody to call. There might be a manufacturer, but the objects are essentially directly interfacing with each other rather than being tied together by a kind of bureaucracy and an agreement and an arrangement, right? There's no skill attached to the object other than me. No. So if I'm in a hospital and I'm a surgeon, the anesthesiologist and his technicians are responsible for making sure that the patient stays under and stays oxygenated, right? Um, and I, as a surgeon, am never going to be doing the low level interfacing with the oxygen supplier to make sure that the valves that they fit, fit the equipment that we've got. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And what I'd been searching for for years was how do I get a low level interface that will allow me to build a model of the world of stuff so that I can get the stuff to directly connect together, right? Okay. What I had in mind something that looks almost like a matter compiler where you could get type errors when things wouldn't correctly interface with each other. That makes sense. Okay. So, you know, I've got, I've got a table full of equipment and I basically say to the matter compiler, right, can I plug this amp into that microphone, into those speakers, into that power socket with this, the cables that are in this cable back, right? And I want the computer to look at that and say, yes, and here's how you wire it up. Okay? And I had been chasing that vision of this is how it ought to work you know, off and on for more than 10 years, right? I, I kept thinking, there's got to be a way of solving this, there's got to be a way of solving this, there's got to be a way of solving this. What I finally realized is, even if there is a way of solving it, for most human beings, that's the equivalent of machine code programming, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The actual interface that they want is they want the AV tech to just come and make it work. They have no interest in the tools themselves. Their interest is in the activity they want to do, and they want a human being to wrangle the tools for them. And that was the moment of realization for me, like, oh, ordinary people navigate the world by finding a person that has the skills and the tools as a bundle and then hiring. It's, it's offloading skill. Yes. I have the thing that allows me to do the thing that I want. I don't have the skill to operate it, so I'm offloading that to somebody else. Yes. But what the, the way that people conceptualize this is they wrap the skills and the tools into essentially effects packages. Mm -hmm. so if I want a photograph, I need a photographer. If I want a, a shed, I need a carpenter. Um, it's more efficient that way if you don't have the skill, because there's no reason for me to buy something if I want to do something once, right? If I want to just get to a place that requires some tools and skills once, or mm -hmm. I want to try it on or do something, then I just, I just hire someone to do that so that I can try it or get it done once. It's not cost efficient or time efficient for me to try and get that skill set appropriately, potentially screw it up than it is to just be one off pay somebody or offload that to somebody else. Absolutely. And where that threshold is depends on what your existing skill base is and how quickly you were. Yeah. So if you learn very, very quickly, you've got a big skill base in the area already, it's often pretty efficient to grab the next tool in line. And that's how you wind up with a workshop that has one of everything in it. Mm -hmm. And say, like, ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay some guy to come around to my house and pour some concrete, or, or am I going to do that myself? Well, how hard can it be? And you watch the videos on YouTube, and you kind of roll the dice, and you open there. So that, that mindset for me of realizing that for most people, the the tool barrier is much higher than I experience it to be. Explain to me the social structures that I was seeing around how people use tools. Because in fact, what most people want is a professional to use the tool on their behalf. And what they maintain is a social index of those professionals. So most people navigate around the space of things by using people's proxies. And, and there's, there's quite a bit of evidence for this. I mean, you, I think you mentioned it. It's like most people today's, I guess, middle-class society or people who don't have time to build skills because it's still like, like you, I think you pointed out, it's very cheap to buy, to buy tools. It's very expensive to gain a skill. 
And if you don't have that time or, 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 or money or whatever the resource value is, um, then you see a lack of tools completely because they have this, you know, Rolodex of proxied people for tools. Exactly. Right. Um, so that, so that model, right, that, that insight that the entire thing is fundamentally a social machine in which tools are tied to identities, the model that I had had previously for dealing with critical infrastructure assumed that what we were doing was wiring together bureaucracies, right? And what I realized is that we're still wiring together bureaucracies because it's only at the extremely low level, people like AV technicians, you know, the people that are really touching metal daily, that we build up the practical experience of wiring the damn machines together, right? We, we actually, as a society, have a relatively small number of people that know how to operate the machines. Their job is to operate the machines, and basically that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy that knows how to run the recording studio is there to run the recording studio. That's his entire identity. So we, I, mean, if, I guess if you want to use like a common nomenclature in software development, we like, like society is a microservices industry. Yes, exactly. Right? Now, when I've been thinking about this as being a technical problem, for me, when I look at the world, the question is, how do I get the tools to do that? Because I'm confident that if I have the tools, I can acquire the skills to at least the first approximation. Right? Um, and that realization that most people, when you hand them the tools, they feel helpless rather than empowered, that to me was the critical insight. It's like, oh, okay, I'm weirdly tool literate because I grew up in a family that was all about tools, right? Weaving and carpentry and, you know, kind of sort of ordinary day-to-day -day medicine. These things are very, very much about using equipment to solve problems. Mm -hmm. We have complex mental models that go along with the equipment. Um, but at the end of the day, it's using equipment to solve problems um, in a really big way. So I, I had this very deep blind spot in terms of thinking about how the world works relative to the tools around us right? and that sort of the untangling of that resolves a whole bunch of fundamental questions that i've had about the relationship between things and markets now that's what i'm curious about from there like now that you've made that separation what insight did that allow you to move forward with so the, the think of the whole sharing economy story, right? You know, this was big 10, 15 years ago, the world was going to run on a sharing economy and it was going to hugely reduce our environmental footprint. Mm -hmm. um, that approach largely failed, right? And it failed for three or four re separable reasons. One of them is it turned out that most people didn't have anything worth sharing, right? So what you wound up with was a renting economy for the people who had assets which were worth sharing and then rented them to the people that wanted to share them, right? Sharing required people to have kind of peer pools of assets that they were renting to each other or sharing with each other. But when you had some people with assets and some people without assets, you got a renting economy. The second thing is that, you know, if there was a service which would come around to my house and deliver me, you know, $20,000 worth of DSLR equipment in two hours, like, you know, pizza delivery or something, um, you know, 45 minutes or you get your money back. If there was a service that did that, I wouldn't know how to use equipment at that caliber, right? I can get my way around, you know, kind of mid-grade camera reasonably easily, but if you start talking about really high-end equipment, I'm not going to be able to get the best out of it. Mm -hmm. And that was actually a huge part of why the sharing economy didn't work, right? People didn't know how to use the stuff that was available for them to share, right? And a lot of that is because in this society, it's quite hard how to, to learn how to do something unless you own one of the things that you're learning on, right? You're not going to borrow a mountain bike yeah. to learn how to mountain bike. Typically, you're going to mountain bike on your own mountain bike a lot till you know how to do it. And then after that, you might occasionally borrow a bike if you're on vacation or something. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. right. So what actually is happening is that we spend a lot of time purchasing things that we then spend a lot of time faffing around with to see whether we like the activity or not. And if we do like the activity, we keep it and become a person where that thing is built into our identity. I am a home brewer. And if we don't like it, and this is the key, the stuff typically winds up mothballed in the garage. I mean, it's also like a, it's a, it's a, 
I don't want to say a litmus test, but a, a meter of how much you are that thing based on the things you've acquired within that within that skill set. And there's this deep weaving together of identity, um, physical stuff, and skill. Yeah. Right. Now that nexus, you know, I mean, you're in America or Canada? I'm in America. I'm in Maryland. Okay, Maryland. Right. So, you know, you know how much stuff there is in American basements and garages. Oh, yeah. And I remember growing up in Texas, I remember having to clean the garage out multiple times because the car no longer fit in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Now, that's not happening because we figured out the correct market value of stuff. Right. And even eBay doesn't solve that problem. Right. But I reckon that there is probably, you know, a decent sized country's worth of equipment sitting unused in American garages and boxes haven't been opened in 10 years, right? That could easily be 20% of America's environmental footprint is in unproductive junk that's in boxes that hasn't been opened for 10 years that we haven't figured out how to bring back into the marketplace to prevent new junk being made. How many people in America have a canoe that's just sitting in the rafters of a barn, right? because they don't use it and they haven't used it in years. And, you know, somebody could be using that canoe, but instead they're going to either go without a canoe or they're going to rent a canoe or they're going to buy a canoe. Yep. Like the world is clogged by underutilized objects. Right? And that condition where the world is clogged with underutilized objects, we can actually do something about that. Uh, is it the world or is it the subset of the world that has free time to do these things. Oh, well, specifically or, it's rich world. Yeah. Right. And you know, we're in a position where we've got this massive burgeoning global middle class, right? If the middle class Indians, the middle class Chinese and the middle class South Americans all adopt the same relationship with physical objects that Europeans and Americans have, we are screwed. Yeah. It's going to be a gigantic environmental disaster. So what I'm really kind of fishing around for here is a set of new social practices mediated by technology to dramatically reduce the amount of overconsumption of uh, surplus material goods, right? We keep making things that we're just not using. And I think that's fixable. How did you, I could say like, that's just something that almost a gripe that I've had um, with, I'd say, some of the younger generation, which is now a byproduct of this this behavior that you've just laid out to us, is that um, we'll just go we'll go with the old man mentality. Kids these days have it all. Um, they're able to figure out and understand how to do basically anything based on the amount of information that's been amassed in just YouTube alone. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why they shouldn't be able to figure out and do anything. Yet we're not seeing a lot of that. We're seeing maybe yeah. new things, but like, like, there's no reason why someone should should um, not be able to go do something by watching a couple of YouTube videos and giving it a shot. And I think a lot of this plays into this, whether it be they grew up in a society where um, they don't have the tools, so they have to go out and buy it if they can, or um, they're just it, there's a social culture of offloading that responsibility. Yeah, and th this I think is the the crux of it, right? So you need the tools to learn and you may need somebody to teach you. Right? So the somebody to teach you goes out to YouTube and the tools to learn is potentially borrowing the tools that somebody else used to learn. Right? Mm -hmm. So think of like homebrewing, right? The world is filled with used half a dozen times brewing gear. Right? Yes, absolutely. I could probably name um, personal identification of those things. Uh, across six or seven households. You see, right? So what we need is an efficient way for somebody who's going to give homebrewing a try to get the kit from somebody that just gave homebrewing a try and decided that it wasn't for them. Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, it might be that you gave it a try, you scratched the itch, it turned out to be really fun, but it was less fun than not homebrewing, right? And some people become, you know, devotional, vocational homebrewing is their thing and it integrates into their identity. Most people give it a try for a while and then pass the, then the equipment just sits there. And what I'm suggesting here is that what we're doing with a lot of the equipment is we're trying on identities. Am I a home brewer? Is that going to be a part of my life? Is that going to be a thing that I master? I tried it. It worked out pretty well. We pass it on. It goes to somebody else. 
Right? But what's happening is we're failing to pass the stuff on, so we're winding up a bunch of junk. And I think that, that part of the story is the place where there's room for us to make a technological intervention. Right? You try the experiment, and, and by the way, this is not a technological intervention, this is a techno-social intervention. Yeah, uh, I was about to say that. Like, a, a part of that is, like, I'm, I'm kind of curious if the mass of things is trying on for identity leads to this kind of um, reluctance to let go of things because you want to have a specific identity. Um, I think there is some of that, right? I mean, certainly the underutilized exercise machinery is a huge part of that story, yeah. right? You know, the, the um, uh, what are the cyclones, Pelotrons or something? Yeah, the, 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 the brand, yeah, Pelotrons, I think. Yeah, so you know, there are a lot of things that are bought and then not used because people want to be, you know, young and strong and healthy and fit, and it just turns out to be a ton of work. So, you know, getting rid of the exercise machine is letting go of that future. But the home brewing example, I think the problem is market value. It's just more work to list the damn stuff on eBay yeah, than it, than it is to get My wife throws, gives things to Goodwill and throws things away more than she would list it on a, a, a market like this because of the effort to price it and do it and then deal with the aspect of getting like, dealing with each individual relationship of getting rid of it. And so we're stuck in this environment where we've got things which are too expensive to give away too useful to throw away, but below the level of value where it's economically efficient for us to go through the process of listing it on eBay and then selling. So we're clogging up the world with things which are too valuable to give away and not expensive enough to sell. And that's hundreds of millions of tons of equipment sitting in American basements. What's the solution? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you solve that? I mean, I'm assuming that's what you've been spinning a good portion of your life trying to figure out, are you closer well, to a solution? So weirdly enough, I mean, Materium starts with an attempt to build uh, essentially a Supreme Court of the internet, which will go right along with it, you know, Bitcoin as the world's, you know, the internet's central bank, right? Mm -hmm. The central bank of the internet, Materium was intended to be the Supreme Court, right? And it just turns out there isn't enough real trade happening using cryptocurrencies to support a Supreme Court of the internet, right? We're just, we're just not seeing enough disputes that resolve in a legal way for us to discover each other. So about a year ago, we pivoted and said, well, look, you know, this was all about getting control of assets in the material world. How are we going to do that? That leads to a second round of research, which turns into discovering the asset passport. And we're now in the kind of very late stages of setting up the alpha for the asset passport. So the asset passport is Materium's way of you know, canonically giving a name to a physical thing and identifying it in a way that gives us a solid handle for it. Um, so, you know, this this whole thinking about things and skills is basically me saying, okay, shortly we're going to have this ability to generate asset passports for things. And I'm perfectly happy doing, you know, fine wine laptops, Stradivarius violins, and, you know, the rest of what have you. But... You know, those are all things which are relatively mechanistic and they don't have a lot of social good attached to them. But the prospect of making a small incremental improvement to how middle class and richer global society relate to the material world, I think that there's the possibility of some real social innovation there. And, you know, it's not that we're not in an age where things like that happen, right? Airbnb was a huge shift in human behavior mm -hmm. and it's had enormously positive effects in most people's lives. I think most people would agree that the world is a better place with Airbnb than without it. Uber, you know, they're losing money hand over fist and they don't treat their drivers very well. But the same kind of thing is true of Uber. Mm -hmm. Right? It Part really the, the so, social the social aspect of like um how humans naturally communicate or, or or negotiate these types of behaviors is better. It's not as constrained as it once was with the previous things. Exactly. Right. So I think that there's room for something like that, but for physical material. Right? So, you know, we have this raw technology. Okay, we're going to do something that looks like DNS and it allows us to bind metadata to physical things and then publish services that allow you to do things with physical things. Great, right? But then I'm trying to figure out how do we get, you know, the kind of 
you know, 100 million users, blockchain app finally goes mainstream kind of outcome from that, which is what we're all shooting for, right? We're all shooting for that. The blockchain becomes fully integrated into ordinary people's lives and they use it 30 times a day and they never know. And what I'm kind of, you know, sitting here with the watchmaking gear, just kind of tweaking and twiddling on is how do we take that brewing kit that somebody bought, right? Used six times, said, right, I've had enough of that. And they repackage that stuff into a format where somebody else will buy it for something close to the original cost. Right? So how do we get from where we are to there? Well, you need to be able to identify the stuff. You need to be able to find a person that wants to consider brewing. They're probably also in the market for some training or they're going to watch some YouTube videos. They're going to go through an identity acquisition process. And that identity acquisition process is you've got the stuff, you've got the skills, and then you do the ritual which makes you a brewer. You make the thing. And, you know, that making of the thing and the combination of information, skill acquisition, identity, physical equipment, and a sort of procedural thing, we're using the material world to go through these kind of dramatic reenactments of new roles all the time. The things are props in our stories. And the problem that we have is that we're not passing the props on to the next person that wants to tell the story. Right. So this idea that the things exist as props in narratives and that what we need is a way of trying the, the role on and then letting the role go and then taking off the clothes and passing them on. Right. I think that there's the possibility of using the blockchain to mediate that translation. And I think that that could potentially produce a social shift in the way that we think about things in the same way the Airbnb has shifted how we think about space. I love that concept. Um, one of the things I've been recently drastically fascinated with and something I think is incredibly important in terms of shifting social culture is developing the um, infrastructure for micro economies. And that's a mm -hmm. lot of what you just described. Tell me a bit more about the microeconomies concept. Um, let, me, let me find let me find this this tweet that you say um, in the process of acquiring things to try on an identity. Um, maybe I can't find the tweet, but I'll summarize here. It's basically you 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 buy a thing uh, to develop a skill um, to try on an identity to join a subculture. Um, once you, as you develop the skill, you then have feedback within that subculture. So you're joining a community um, in the process of doing those things. The infrastructure to do all of that is very important. Right now, we have things that are maybe uh, narrow-minded and the or, or constrained in, in the process of doing that. Think about you know Reddit and all of it, some, some subreddits. What do those lack? Those lack uh, physical like, connections with people. They lack the ability to transact value within those people. So you have micro economies within those micro communities. Right, right, right. So um, you're and then the, open the, open red, what you're saying is this, the passing on of the tools, taking off the clothes and giving it to someone who'd like to maybe participate in this micro community. If you no longer want to participate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and it's the transactional friction that's nailing us here, yeah. right? Payments are hard. There is fraud. So the, that, yeah, that that's yeah, absolutely. What, tell me a bit more about how you're thinking about geography and micro communities. Well, I mean, you can't. It's it's it is more difficult to um, pass on a used brewer set to someone who's across the globe than it is in your local community. If I can't drive it, meet you in a same the same place, more like you know what local Ethereum is or local Bitcoin is. Uh, that, that it adds a little bit more friction. Now, there's ways to fix that, I'm sure, but it, there is friction there. Uh, the digital micro communities are always going to be easier to facilitate than physical good micro communities. So, when you say micro communities, you're thinking of like communities of interest, or are you thinking about also specific geographies? I originally feel it's communities of interest. Uh, a geography would be a subset to that interest because it's less friction. I would join my 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 local brewers club, quick, um, and have more real social interactions with them before you know the people the people associated with the subreddit of home brewing. Mm -hmm. So like real physical human interaction, um, you you can I would 
quickly go to a local brewers club to do that type of thing. Whereas maybe information that's less impersonal and things I can learn from, I'll go from a broader audience. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think this is quite interesting because it kind of splits out the skills from the equipment. Yeah. You know, like the, the skills really are a global marketplace then. You know, how to information just slushes around on the internet in piles. Um, but the physical material and the skill to use it. Um, you know, I went camping with some friends over the weekend and, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time outdoors, you know, not so much recently, but, you know, I spent years, you know, in tents and stuff over the years. And, you know, I was tying like trucker stitches and you know, a trucker stitch is not a complicated knot, mm -hmm. but it's a really useful knot and it looks quite complicated. Um, and, you know, it was just this thing of like, I, I realized it was just like not magic. And then I thought, actually, you know, I'm good at tying this knot because I learned how to tie knots when I was a Boy Scout. And I've continuously used knots, you know, all the way through my life. And I've watched how they fail and how they succeed and how they work. And, you know, that, that stuff gets baked in, right? To the mm -hmm. point where you don't realize you're doing it anymore. And the internet is great for learning that kind of stuff. Once you know that the skill exists, and, and the skill is missing, you know? So I also feel like there's an ontological aspect to all this that you need to know what your options are. Yeah. And, there's, and it, this is the discovery problem, but it's not the discovery problem for books or music. It's the discovery of, for identity and equipment to support identity. And that's really the thing that I want to kind of drive home is that I think that we've fundamentally, you know, fucked up consumerism because we didn't understand the role that things had in the formation of identity. Like we've made a fundamental conceptual error in the relationship between things and identity that's resulted in massive overproduction of crap, stockpiling of junk in American basements on an epic scale, and the inability to get people the things that they need, even though they're sitting inside of somebody's basement, you know, 200 yards from where they are. Right? there's a huge kind of core log jam there. And um, kind of like if we had failed to develop libraries, right? If the only way that you could get access to books was by buying them and people didn't lend books to each other as a matter of course, if all the information in books was hoarded and it was kind of weird to look at somebody else's bookshelf and ask to borrow, borrow a book, if books had been property that was not lent anywhere and it, there was no culture around lending books, um, we would have fundamentally broken publishing, right? We wouldn't have the same relationship with data that we have, but the library taught us that knowledge was a common good and it gave us the culture of sharing knowledge and it started with books and then it became everything else. Like if there'd been a library movement, there'd probably be no free software. And I feel like somewhere along the line, we kind of, we took a wrong turn in our relationship with physical material in a way that's caused this enormous log jam at the center of our civilization. I wonder if buying the thing um, was the quickest option for trying on something. Um, mm -hmm. But the problem is that there's not a lot of time um, or there's not a lot of available time because one needs to sustain themselves. Um, yes. And so in the process of the problem, the, the, I think a main problem with this, this is also why I'm interested in kind of micro economies and micro communities or like micro communities that have economies enabled within them yeah. is that uh, currently as you try on an identity, there's no way, even if you join a subculture or a culture and you can, you contribute to it and you spend a good portion of your time, your free time contributing to this thing and you become part of this, this community and it is a part of your identity, it doesn't allow you to sustain yourself until you've gained the status of expert where you can then market your skills in some, in some way that can then offset your typical, I need to sustain myself income. Yeah. That's a problem because the majority of people who would potentially go on to love and be something of a community that they'd like to do can never get to the point of sustaining themselves. Yes, absolutely. And I mean that is a super hard problem in a rapidly changing economy. That's a that's a it's it's a it's a it's a step function. It's not it's not a gradual shift. 
And so you can never slowly move into something. It has to be a giant leap of faith or a, a very risky decision. And all, all that takes risk capital. It takes the ability to absorb shock and loss. Yeah. Um, I, I'm quite interested by the process by, where, by which people become professional video gamers. Well, that was a, uh, I think that led, was a potential, or partially led, um, by their ability to stream playing video games and making revenue off of that, which was led from YouTube into Twitch. Yeah, and absolutely. so because they were able to sustain themselves, building up small communities of people watching them play video games, they then gathered the requisite skill set to join teams, as well as ability to monetize through advertisements and so on and so forth, um, mm -hmm. which then gave them like the, a massive leg up in the, I guess you can call it the 10,000 hours required to become an expert. Absolutely. And I mean, that is a weird thing to me because, like, you know, I kind of gave up video games about uh, 91 or 92. Um, I was at university and Civilization came out, and you couldn't get on a PC anywhere in Edinburgh University for like four months, right? Everybody was playing Civilization. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was impossible. It literally, I mean, we, that was so early enough that we had uh, WISE terminals and PCs side by side in a lot of the labs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was, it was an ecology with some workstations, you know, IBM PCs and uh, WISE terminals. And you know, you could always get in a WISE terminal, but you know, get it. You no know, one cares because you can't play Civ. <laughs> right? And that that was the point where I basically stopped playing video games. I helped write a couple of video games after that, but I didn't, I didn't play games in any kind of dedicated way. So watching video games go from you know a thing that i did with my mates when i was like nine years old or 12 you know eight bit games and all the rest of that to you know massive global industry with like you know feature film budgets and you know these crossovers where you've got things that happen in the video game world that become part of the mainstream this stuff is all it's really really super confusing but then you see the economic models and it's like these guys are now like musicians. There's an entire subculture. The games come with identities, and there are kids who are defined by their love of a game franchise like uh, Assassin's Creed. They're 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 like, idolized heroes for for a lot of people. They build communities around them. Yeah, and I mean, I bet there are kids right now that are going out there to study ninjutsu because they saw Assassin's Creed and thought that would be the thing to learn. You know, um, so that. You know, what that tells me is that the identity formation thing is super hardwired, right? In my generation, the, ident the cultures that people formed identity around were largely musical cultures. Mm -hmm. You know, punks, goths, ravers, metalheads, you know, folkies, and these things were clearly identifiable subcultures. Yeah. Right? Now, I think that that is kind of, you know, music is a culture, games is a culture, sports is a culture there's much less differentiation inside the categories where the categories are much more differentiated. Um, and I guess that's probably all largely driven by access to information. You've got way more pick and choose in these salads. Um, but we're still in this position where we haven't correctly conceptualized the relationship between things and their narratives. And that, you know, if what well, I'm really I'm trying to figure out how to say this, I'm really driving at is this idea that we fundamentally misunderstood how the material world intersects with our lives. The relationships between um, the object and how a person uses it to interact with some group of people. The object and the subject, right? I mean, really it is the object and the subject. And, you know, these things are, they're, God, I can't remember, using the word in, in actual conversation, right? This stuff is all semiotic. We, we got into a position where things were largely identified by their symbolic value, right? You know, it's a big, you know, heavy looking thermos flask with a funny looking screw lid in it and a place to put a carabiner, right? It's an outdoor guy thermos flask. Why did I wind up buying an outdoor guy thermos flask? Well, because I lived in America for 12 years. I was in Colorado for about half of it. You know, there was a period of my life when I was more comfortable with a backpack on than not a backpack on. So that was the natural thing to buy. But the actual function is it's a water bottle that lives in my house that I drink water out of. I'm not sure the thing has ever been outside. <laughs> it's yeah. too heavy to take a cap, right? Lovely thing, too heavy to take a cap. So that, 
that see this is the, this is the gnarl right so advertising and marketing and innovation you know, for companies and all the rest of this kind of stuff they are super focused on buying decisions how do we get people to buy our stuff because after all that's what they're getting paid for what they're not focused at all on is how do people get rid of our stuff yeah they're buying the narrative yeah. of the life you get by buying the object or like they're, they're selling the narrative of the life you get by buying the object that is in essence marketing right but we don't have anything to go the opposite of like how do i get rid of this narrative now that i have it to call the idea really it. I tried it for a while i don't want it anymore now i need to get rid of the identity right i'm not a brewer anymore i mean oh god let me take a minor detour into the homebrew thing so for a while we threw a lot of parties at my house um because it was the first time in like 10 years I'd had a place that was big enough to have a party. And, you know, the blockchain world was filled with enthusiasm and people were just bouncing off the walls and it was like, this was a good time to have a party. So yes, I remember those days. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So uh, I had heard about this crazy stuff called turbo yeast. And turbo yeast was some, you know, genetically engineered yeast from Russia that would turn just about anything into 20% alcohol in 48 hours. Oh my god yeah i know it's monstrous so kind of as a gag we got hold of some turbo yeast and we made wine right and it was hilariously bad right <laughs> yeah yeah i can imagine but it tasted fantastic as mulled wine right when you turned it into mulled wine it went from being terrible to being really good mulled wine because a lot of the flavors in real wine actually don't turn out that well in mulled wine, but terrible wine makes really good mulled wine. So we just did these parties through a winter that were just fueled by enormous amounts of mulled wine. And this stuff gave people horrific hangovers. And we literally brewed it three days before the damn parties in a big old cooler. Uh, cooler. We literally made the wine in a cooler. It was like prison hooch. <laughs> and, the, and the entire process was completely hilarious. Because, you know, the story was, you know, here is the cooler with the tap on the front of it out of which the wine comes. Here is the packet taped to the front of it that we made it out of. And by the way, we made it last week. Right? And it was hilarious as a shtick for about three parties. And then it was like, okay, we're done with that. We're going to go back to drinking beer. That was the end of the, the brewing experiment. But during that shenanigan, that material equipment was useful and the skills were useful. Not that there was much skill. But then at the end of that experiment, I'm never going to go back to doing that again, right? But the equipment still lingers, right? There is still a container sitting in a cupboard that went with that shenanigan, right? And what we just don't have is the bloody machinery for binding the container to the shenanigan, expressing its existence in a digital form, and then pumping it to somebody that wants to play that game. Yeah, because like there's, there's, there's obviously... It leads me to a whole different kind of thought process, but like that, there's parts of that of those of those materials, those objects that you, that you use to do this, engage in this 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 fun activity, are useful in other contexts. Yeah. Um, so you could potentially punt pieces of those things to different people. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're lacking here, right? When we were kids, you know, your parents kind of want you to keep track of your toys because you'd be upset if you lose them. As adults, what we're not very good at is saying this is ended. We finished with this. We don't want it anymore. We don't need it anymore. If we need it again, we'll reacquire it. Right? And it's that ability to cut and seal and have closure psychologically that I think is why we're getting trapped in these labyrinths of stuff. Well, it's also part of the, I guess, part of our lack of the ability to get rid of things is our um, tendency to hold on to the desire to hold on to the identity. But mm -hmm if the barrier of entry slash exit was lowered dramatically, that may not be there anymore. Absolutely. And so what this kind of moves towards is this idea that we could see a different relationship between people and things, right? Because, you know, if you think of like Germany, in Germany, people hardly ever own their homes because they've got a rental economy that really works for people. And in German conditions, it actually is, is a very performant economic America, home ownership culture, you buy a house, you dig in, that's what you do, right? Britain is kind of somewhere in between. The 
the conditions that we're moving into globally, <clears throat> we can't afford identity to be tight, tightly coupled to material goods if we shift identity and the material goods pile up and accumulate. We need a, an almost ritualistic framework of stepping into an identity, acquiring the tools, acquiring the systems, playing the role for as long as we like, and then passing the entire thing down to somebody else, more or less lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, and I think that this comes down to software mediation, right? I think that the actual handling of the goods is really pretty complicated. So we need to know what it was when it was new. We need to know what it's good for now. We need to know if it's been damaged. We need to know how much it's worth. We need all the transactional friction taken away. And eBay got halfway there and has resulted in a gigantic market for things being recycled and reused. And then but, other markets that try and mimic it from there. Lots of other markets. Yeah. But they're all dumb markets because they talk about things, not about identities. Right? They're they are they are not they're not and, and the and because the seller always has more information than the buyer, these things are also lemon markets. So it's hard to buy things second hand because you're often too experienced inexperienced to know whether the more experienced person is ripping you off when they sell it to you. Yeah, that's a good point. So we've got just two or three levels of kind of structural disincentives to these kind of economies. And I think that the blockchain potentially chips away at least two of those, maybe all of them. I'm actually interested in a consequence of this infrastructure existing and working appropriately. Mm. One of the, I guess, maybe a gripe that I have is that like, if you look at, let's, let's look at American consumerism and, and the tools they have in their kitchen. Ah, here we go. Like single use specific tools um, that get used once, that you get used very occasionally that a general purpose tool would take care of perfectly if they had the skill to do so. Oh, that's interesting. What kind of stuff? Let's say um, a tool that cores um, only Kiwis. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. I have so, one in my kitchen. I don't know why I have it, but it's in there. Right. Right. I have a right. tool that's specific to coring kiwis because we drink a lot of uh, Brazilian um, drinks called caipirinhas. We mix a bunch of fruit in them, and so on and so forth. Yeah. 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 I see how that goes. Um, so this is it. I think this is. I'm not. I'm not going to say it's it's specific to America, but it's definitely a consumerism driven thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you had a framework like this, and you were able to look at the information in which um, maybe how useful something is, and then if the, and then the frequency in which it's traded and its market price, you'll be able to identify um, the things you need to get the things done that you want to do much more easily, as opposed to saying, I need to do this thing. Okay, this thing is specifically made for it. I'm going to go buy that thing, as opposed to, um, I want to do this thing. This thing does it, but all these other things, which then um, allows me to potentially try on those identities as well for those other things, as well as lowers the barrier entry to exit these things. And in an ideal world, you have infantry management software that knows everything that you are. Yeah, which is also a scary thought. <clears throat> well, I mean, this is the wonder of cryptography, is that it can know everything you own, but you can be the only person that knows. Yeah, right? okay, that's a good point. If it's, done, if it's implemented correctly, which things have not been done very well up until now. Um, Computer has only on your device. Yeah. So I download the recipe from the cloud. Then on my computer, we do the matching between the assets that I have and the recipe, and it tells me whether I need to buy anything new or not. It's a world I want to exist, and I try, and I and I and I hope that I can um, watch it and help it come into existence. But there's a lot of roadblocks to get there, as you've been spending the last ten. You know, at the last decade or more of your life trying to figure out. Yes, but I think that we are at a transition point. I mean, so the, the what we're doing with Materium right now, the thing that I'm actually spending my days on, is chipping away at the interface between blockchain and semantic web. And we haven't been talking about this very much at all because we wanted to keep our mouths shut until we had a pretty good idea about how it was going to work. But the semantic web community has spent 15 years building incredibly detailed ontologies for describing physical processes. So, for example, the ontologies that are used by the chemical engineering world are phenomenally detailed. They're incredibly specific. 
Um, because they're being used to represent knowledge inside of chemical engineering processes, and those processes are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, so the knowledge representation work that's been done by the semantic web community and the semantic linked data community, that stuff has come along so far, but it's not gone through the kind of explosive kabang that you saw from AI or the explosive kabang you saw from blockchain. But I'm completely convinced that the union of the semantic web and the smart contract is what produces this next wave of internet development. Right? I want to buy a computer tomorrow morning with two USB ports that will run the following version of Windows and that is at least this fast. Right? Show me the closest machine that meets my spec. Right. Well, that spec has to be expressed in some kind of markup language. Otherwise, how do we do a search? You're not going to get that kind of specificity yeah. through a free text. All of the models for representing those kind of things are, now exist, right? The semantic web guys have ontologies for everything. <clears throat> so you take the object, you express the object's attributes using these uh, you know, metadata formats from the semantic web folks you put the hashes of those things on the chain, you store the files themselves in something like IPFS, you put some metadata somewhere it's easy to find. And what we begin to get is the ability for people to publish an existence proof for a physical object. And okay, we start inside of tight, narrow, defined verticals, but once people have got the ability to put up a, a smart contract for an object in the same way that you used to be able to put up a web page for a hobby, I think that we could see a, a very strong tendency for people to take things that they're not currently using very much, that they might sell or rent, and you've got a single permanent record for that object, which exists across multiple owners. Right. So the transaction cost of creating the, ma the master record to describe the thing happens once, and then whoever happens to own it just updates the master record if there's any change in the thing's condition. And you see, immediately we begin to radically drop the price of the transactions because if the seller that you bought it from gave an accurate description, why are you going to rewrite the description when you pass it down the line? And so we begin to conceptualize that there is a permanent description of the thing in and of itself having its own identity. And then we become the keepers of those things while they serve our narratives. But the thing no longer serves the narrative the thing is detached from your identity and passed on to somebody else's. And we don't have to go through the work of continually re-describing and re-narrating the thing because we give the thing its own respect and we give the thing its own identity, which is independent of our involvement with it. See what I'm saying? Absolutely, yeah. Right? And we've got this in video games. Right? All these kids are playing games in which the things are externally described by the game and you pass the stuff on and take new stuff whenever you need it all the time. They're already well trained to the idea of machine management of inventory. So maybe it just slots right on top of video game culture that you get something that gives you like an inventory screen for your equipment. I think we're seeing that, and that'll be that'll be one of the first use cases of uh, our like ex implementations of this concept is through video games and the items you you gain when evolve, so on and so forth within those video games. And then the, tr the free market trading of those items as people want, need, desire uh, new identities within them or, or done with the video game. Um, you saw, saw the a first effort try of this in a real world market with like the Diablo 3 auction house, which was then turned into basically just pit playing the auction house. Um, so you need, I guess, a fair infrastructure to be able to do this, and I think that's what you're, you'll you'll end up seeing with some of these maybe trading card games, which then lead into a more general use case, so on and so forth, and then attaching physical goods to these things. Because, like I said earlier, I guess um, doing this in a purely digital context is, uh, I think, easier to do than when actually attaching physical goods to them. Yes. Digital is super easy because the descriptions are self-performing, right? The description of the object in yeah. a digital environment is the object. But, you know, I mean, this, this water bottle here, you know, there is an exact digital model of this that it was manufactured from. And if the manufacturer would give me access to that model, I could just tie this to that model, and it would be 
perfectly and completely specified for the next person who wanted to buy it. Mm -hmm. I mean, as it is, I can point to the URL on it and that will tell us a whole bunch of stuff as long as the manufacturer maintains the URL. But why shouldn't the object have a copy of its own DNA? Yeah, it's scarcity. It's just, it's attaching scarcity to it or like unique identification that's looked up. I think it's almost laziness, right? I mean, the manufacturers don't realize that people want really precise definitions of the things. Um, but do they? But is that is that is that, that is that a similar mistake that you've made with uh, tools and their skills or one thing? Do people care? I think people don't care, but the machines care. Okay. If if it enables them to do something they couldn't do before because their machines care, then they care. Exactly. Right. So think of the uh, furniture, right? IKEA has this app which will put furniture in your room in AR so you can figure out whether or not you want that piece of furniture in your house or not. Very powerful, very elegant, very, very fancy. Um, Somebody, I think Google is now doing this for dog breeds. You could put a virtual dog in your house and it'll show you how big the dog is. you know, the things are increasingly being bought on the basis that you've seen their virtual representation, you want the virtual representation. So, you know, the, the smooth blending together of the thing that's virtual, uh, virtuality, I think is turning into a, a different relationship with reality already. I, I've seen the virtual furniture, I've laid the virtual furniture out in my house, I like the virtual house, furniture, I say, you know, make it so, and somebody comes and delivers it and puts it up for me. And me and the person who put it up for me are working from the same operational map. Yeah. Um, so the other thing is industrial use. All this stuff in a consumer context is pretty high highfalutin and pretty complicated. But in an industrial setting, it's much clearer to see how this works. Um, because in an industrial setting, you're almost always buying things from uh, specifications and often from the lowest bidder. It's also not as generalized and then from an industrial perspective, you're doing something, you're trying to do it as, as efficiently as possible in a narrow scope. Exactly. Right. Your um, API so, is a little more narrow, if you will, using, you know, software speed. And, and the range of things that you're buying is much more restricted. Yeah. Have you ever seen the Granger catalog? Yes. Right. So, you know, for folks that don't know, the Granger catalog is probably, I don't know, three times the length of Lord of the Rings. I think it's <laughs> I mean, it's printed on it's, paper. It's just huge, like yeah. Um, and it's everything that you would need to run industrial civilization. You know, solvents, step ladders, soldering irons, you know. Uh, Screws, mats, signs on signs on signs. <laughs> right? Everything, right? So <clears throat> if a company like Granger, you know, told the manufacturers, like, look, you know, we're going to charge you, you know, one dollar uh, a year if you don't provide us with these digital models of the things that you're selling. Most of the manufacturers don't mind sharing a th- the 3D model that their thing was made from, right? I mean, there's there's no barrier to entry for somebody copying that model from a physical thing. They've got nothing to lose. Now, the entire manufactured environment can be represented inside of all, uh, augmented reality, right? You can literally get the digital models from the manufacturers, build them into AR, derive a semantic description of the thing from the digital model, width, height, interior dimension, weight, all that stuff can be derived if it's not there already. And so we can basically hypothesize patterns of interaction between physical things from the digital models that the things were created from. This is kind of close to the digital twin model. So you know, will this water bottle fit inside of the cup holder of this car? We ought to be able to get an answer to that before we either buy the car or the water bottle. Because there is a digital model of both of these things around. And will it fit is a question that a machine can answer. You shouldn't have to rely on on a website's ability to provide those options for you. It should come automatically from the manufacturing specs of the thing. Exactly. Exactly, right? And that as a core concept, I think is completely central to what happens in the future, right? Like, I don't think there's any way around um, that as a model. Manufacturers hate it, huge logistical footprint, huge carbon footprint. It's a total pain in the ass. 
Um, and we could get rid of almost all of that if we had trustworthy digital twins for the objects and then software that would realistically model how you look wearing the thing. Um, and, you know, think of the titanic inefficiencies of the clothing industry. You know, the, the amount of waste that comes out of clothing is gigantic, particularly because clothing, um, you know, most people, most clothing, when the thing winds up with a hole in it, you throw the entire garment away. And there's no efficient way of recycling the damn things because for the most part, they're mixed materials and they need to be color matched. Or giving it to someone who doesn't care. Right, right. And, you know, the hipsters very successfully managed to read the entire <laughs> clothing of 1970, right? You know, yeah. do them, they did a good job of doing that. But what we haven't got is a really, you know, comprehensive way of getting a grip on that waste stream. Right. What's producing it? Well, firstly, there's a social convention that we don't mend things anymore. And I think that's highly addressable. That, that leads back to our original conversation of tools and skills. Mm -hmm. Right. Mending is hard, but also mending is somewhat socially forbidden. Right. You know, mending is no longer an activity that has any kind of status or pride attached to it. Uh, I'd say a commodity of goods has also led to that social convention. Exactly, because advertisers, marketers, the people who are manufacturing things, the last thing they want is men in culture. And it's, it's, it's more economically viable, more often than not, to buy something new than amend it if you don't have the tools and skills to do so. Mm -hmm. This is also not a product of total quality um, management. So, you know, things have gotten super cheap to make because we've got complete control of the manufacturing conditions. Total quality management unbelievably transformed the way that society works in ways that nobody even understands. But it's why you can buy a phone for a few hundred dollars that has more computing power than the entire world did in like 1975. Yeah. You know, the defect rate on each one of the components in that phone is like one in a hundred thousand or one in a million or one in ten million. And that's what gives us the ability to build artifacts at this level of complexity without having them break. You know, if the defect rate was one in 10,000, you would never be able to make a phone. So, you know, what I'm, I guess what I'm driving at is if we don't find a better way of managing the role of physical things in our lives, we're going to completely fail to manage the environmental scarcity, which is the fundamental driver of the next 50 years. I, 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 we started, you started out with a conversation of this is an environmental problem. Yeah. And we, we, seven million people to provide for. So they moved into the reason as to why is because people aren't getting rid of their things because they're not, it's not easy to do so, but probably because of uh, infrastructure and then and the social culture built around the infrastructure that currently exists. Yeah. And I mean, right now, uh, Americans live at something like six to eight planets worth of consumption. And, you know, that's a lot of consumption. Right? Europeans are about three to four planets worth of consumption. So between the Americans and the Europeans, they're using practically the entire planet's worth of natural resources before we start dealing with the rest of the human race. Right? We are gigantically over what we can afford to extract from the world. Uh, and it's causing absolute mayhem. Right? Really, really, really causing absolute mayhem. So how do we get a lid on consumption at this kind of scale? Right? How do, how do we re-engineer the way that we use things in a way that could potentially reduce our environmental footprint by 80%, which is about what we're looking at? And I think that if you look at the American basement model, you know, most Americans of the generation that had three car garages probably only ever touch. 10 or 20% of their material possessions in a given year. All that stuff that's sitting in boxes in the attic that is never going to be used, that somebody's going to have to throw away when they die, all of that stuff is wealth that could be reallocated to somebody else, used by somebody else. Certainly I think it's a good start, and especially the concept of reusing it and recirculating it back into people who will use it rather than just throwing it out. Yep, because it all has value. Right? That are, people would buy it for sure if we could only get it to them. Right? 
I mean, it's it's not at all unreasonable that you could do that. Um, but you know, the question is, how do we reach that, right? How do we get into a position where we're actively, you know, engaging with that need? Right? You know, it, it's a. Do you know about the one baggers on Reddit? come across these guys no i haven't so you see a lot of this in the blockchain community um more a year or two than now but you know you still see a lot of it so the one baggers are people that have gotten their entire physical base everything they own down to a single carry-on bag okay Uh, i i know what this is now okay go ahead yeah 10 kilograms of material typically um and it tends to be you know merino wool they pretty much all wear black um you know super slim laptops, you know, sawn off toothbrushes. But it tends to be that they're buying very expensive things, which will last a really long time, and are also extremely multifunctional. Mm-hmm. So high tech, high spec materials, uh, things like uh, Spectra, Dyneema, uh, Cuban, you know, they're, they're really investing in the stuff because when you're only going to buy one bag's worth of material, you're going to get the good stuff. And it needs to do it all. It needs to do it all. So, I mean, the one baggers, these guys are probably on average living in a tiny fraction of their environmental footprint, apart from all the air travel. Yeah. Module of the air travel. Um, Same thing with the Marie Kondo thing. Like, does this give me joy? If not, throw it away. Well, I'm not sure joy is the right metric for most people, but do I still inhabit the identity for which this object is a prop? That's a really good question. I think that's a very interesting, I, don't, I just don't think people have made that connection as well to a lot of these things. And if people ask that question, then they reanalyze um, the things they have and why they have them and, and optimize appropriately. And so imagine that we've got a world in which when you buy something, it leaves you a digital record. So you've got automatic inventory management for your life. I don't have an inventory of what I own. I, I couldn't imagine preparing an inventory of what I own. But down to the last, you know, tent peg and, you know, a single sock. Yeah. Right? Impossible to imagine doing it. There was a time in my life where I could recite from memory every single thing that I owned. I couldn't even right? recite to you the, the books that I have next to me on my bookshelf much less what I have in my life. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And it just turns out that American culture it kind of, you know, zigged when it should have zagged sometime around the 1950s or 1970s. And we got detached from the ability to get rid of things, right? We lost the ability to let go of stuff. We formed new identities with the objects playing kind of prop roles in those stories. Then when we shut down the identities, the props accumulated, we never figured out how to close the show and then get rid of the props that went with the show. And that psychological glitch, you know, has paired very nicely with the needs of manufacturing and advertising because it's crippled the, the functionality of the second hard markets. But now we've got both the economic and the environmental imperative to dramatically reduce our consumption, but we also want to maintain a high quality of living. And I think that what that turns into is incredibly efficient second-hand markets because the goods are remarkably durable. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, digital stuff lasts forever. All my camera gear, you know, is 10 years old, not because I bought it 10 years ago, but because, you know, the, the camera that did what I wanted to do was made 10 years ago, and they're like 100 bucks. And they're beautiful. They're fantastic. They're top-of-the-line Nikon uh, mirrorless from 10 years ago it's a hundred dollars and they're beautiful the the nikon one range they're just beautiful totally totally abandoned right so what i'm getting i guess what i'm positing is this we've got seven and a half billion people that want to be rich um and if we keep telling them that being rich is about having you know twenty five thousand objects in your possession of which you ever only ever use like 250, then there isn't enough room for everybody to be rich. But if we bloody well build something that looks like a search engine for the material world, which says, I want brewing kit, and I'm going to try and learn to brew this weekend, make it happen, 
and somebody brings me their brewing kit, hands it to me, spends two hours telling me what I ought to know about it and what I ought to know about brewing, and then leaves, how much happier am I than if I had to buy the damn stuff and then store it or get rid of it or auction it or go through all of those extremely unrewarding and unsatisfying processes associated with being a seller in a second-hand market. Right? If we can remove the pain of being a seller from the second-hand market, that's where the majority of the glitch is. It's the pain of being a seller, not the pain of being a buyer. The money isn't enough to overcome the pain of being a seller, so the material is clogging up reality. The stuff is not circulating. I'd like to I'd like to wrap up on that thought and, and probably leave our leave our audience with that. Um, I think that's quite a powerful thought in terms of like the concept of what it means to be wealthy, what it means to be rich, and 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 kind of how that then plays into your quality of life so uh thanks for coming on i really enjoyed this conversation i think we dug into what i wanted to dig into and more is there anything that i uh you would have liked me to ask you that i didn't ask so i think we covered pretty much everything um the one bit of it that might be worth talking about in the you know kind of intro of the show notes or something like that is just to say that you know this is fundamentally about transaction costs right it's about the transaction costs associated with life cycle management of physical goods. And as we all know, the blockchain is all about reducing transaction costs. All right. So I will definitely do that. I'll add to the show notes. And uh, how do people reach out to you? How do they learn more? Oh, um, materium.com. Right. I'll add that to the show notes as well. So thanks for coming. Uh, we show us on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs>